July. Uh, my oldest daughter, Amanda, came down. She lives up in Brighton. And her husband came down and brought my new granddaughter, Abigail. So that was fun. We got to hang out with them for a few days. And we went tubing down the river, shot over to Florence to see the fireworks. And so that was great to see them. So we're looking into uh, Revelation again. And this journey together, uh, you know, it's just our heart that you would worship God in a greater measure, that you would see him in a new light, maybe even more hope, seeing what the ending of the story is, compelled to share the story of Jesus with other people, see how much Jesus loves his church, and that justice is served and evil is judged. Amen? Amen. So it's our hope through this series. And so we started out in Revelation. We looked at chapters 1 through 3. And it's mostly about Jesus walking among the churches. And he loved the churches. And he encouraged the churches. And he warned the churches. And he told the churches there was rewards for overcoming. And then we looked at uh, Revelation 4 through 7. They had the scroll. The scroll was opened. The seals were opened. And then we looked at uh, Revelation 8 through 11 where the seven judgment trumpets uh, we saw one-third of things that were destroyed, the two witnesses uh, that were uh, proclaiming, witnessing, and were killed and then raised again in threes. And um, then we saw, um, one thing I saw new that I've been studying is in uh, Revelation 8. Remember we talked about the half hour of silence? There's, there's one theory that is just so devastating. All these things were happening that they took 30 minutes of silence and just, just said, whoa, God, right? Another theory is that there was no one there. That that is the time when all the angels left heaven and Jesus left heaven for the rapture. It says we'll be caught up with him in the air. That in Greek means rapturous. That's where they get the word rapture. So that's just another theory why there was silence in heaven at that point. So, uh, just thing to think about. So anyways, uh, today we're looking at Revelations chapter 12 through 15. And uh, you know, did you know that um, there was debate whether putting Revelation in this Bible, the canon, and our forefathers, you know, they said, you know, there's a lot of crazy stuff in here, <laughs> right? And there is, and they couldn't understand it all. But I'm glad they put it in because what is in here is Jesus' glorious return. What's in here is the worship you see in heaven. What you see here is this battle won by Jesus, right? And finally justice. And finally no more evil. And then the greatest part, no more tear or pain. And so I'm glad they put it in the Bible for us to, to read and to remember that part of it. And that's the main part. Uh, rest can decide, judge, and look at, but that's the main thing, that Jesus is coming again. Amen. So, so in Revelation 12 through 15, we got things dragged, east popping up out of the sea and on earth. We have Michael, the archangel. He's in warfare with the dragon. We got fire shooting down from heaven. Uh, we have the mark of the beast. We got 144,000, and we got the number of the beast. It's all these things we see. In chapter 12, we've got this fierce battle, this war uh, that seems to have been raging since the beginning of time. We've had Satan appear at the very beginning of this book, haven't we? In Genesis, he shows up. And in Isaiah, which we'll look at later, we see, uh, well, here it is right here. Satan is Lucifer. So Lucifer was the worship leader in heaven. He was this awesome being who fell, who started a mutiny in heaven and took one-third of the angels with him. Satan tried to overthrow God, but was thrown to earth and wages war on us still to this day. And so he's filled with madness because he knows time is short. And so let's get into some of this and dig in here. Let's start, I want to start actually in chapter 11, uh, 19. That's kind of where we left off last time. I love this picture it says, then God's temple in heaven was open. Within the temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and earthquake, a great hailstorm. So if you remember in the Old Testament, the ark was kept in the Holy of Holies. 
The priest could go in there once a year. It wasn't something that was seen, but in this picture, it's opened up. The temple's open. Everybody's seeing it. Causes earthquakes, causes hailstorm, causes peals of thunder and lightning. And so it's a great picture. And then we get to chapter 12, 1. The great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, out of 12 star head. She was praying, crying, pain, and she's about to give birth. And one of the for so we have a wondrous sign happen for it. And I always thought uh, this was more of like a Christmas story. You have uh, Mary birthing Jesus and the devil's after him, right? And uh, for my research, I've seen a bigger picture. Mary is involved in a way, but it's really um, Israel. So Israel is this woman. So let's take a look at that's what most theologians uh, agree on. When is there another time when there was a sun and a moon and stars like that? And you remember Joseph, he told the dream that there was all these stalks of wheat and they were all going to bow down to him. Well, he had another dream. This other dream he told his brothers, he said, I had another dream. This is of Genesis 37, 9. And this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. And then Jacob, his dad, interprets the dream. In verse 10, he says, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? So he interprets the dream as the woman, the wife being the moon, him being the sun, and the sons being the 11 stars. And what do we get from Jacob? We get the 12 tribes of Israel, don't we? So really, we have Israel here. Joseph, uh, yeah, Joseph makes up the 12th tribe of, of Israel. So we have the picture of Israel. And so I thought that was interesting uh, to look at. All right, let me see. We got a um, little more about Israel. You know, Israel's been conquered at least, you know, how many times? And in four major wars. And, it's, and the enemy's just been after Israel, hasn't it? The enemy has been after Israel. Why? Because he wants to stop the prophecy of Jesus coming out of Israel. And so we've seen Israel just take a beating and they were held captive and it was destroyed and they, they were able to get back together. I believe it was in 1948 after World War II when they were made a country again and people came back in. And uh, so they've just been at going through it. And then we see Satan coming after Jesus, don't we? When Jesus was born, what was happened? The angel had the son come and say, hey, get out of Bethlehem because Herod is mad and you guys warned him, get out. And Herod kills the beast in Bethlehem. Then we look at uh, even further back in the lineage of David. David is being attacked by Saul. Remember this? Saul has got an evil spirit on him. And so they send David in to comfort him with the harp. <laughs> well, he tries to kill David. He tries to kill that lineage, that line that Jesus is gonna come out of, doesn't he? and it doesn't work. Remember how many battles David was in and, and sores all around him and he was never killed. Why? Because he was chosen to be the lineage that Jesus had to come out of. And so I find that fascinating that here this dragon, and he's just after this woman. It's basically most of what 12 is about. But let's, uh, let's look at a little more of it here. Um, verse Three, then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. Tail swept on the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. And so we see uh, Satan after this woman. And see who this is. It says a red dragon, but in verse 9 it tells us that it's that ancient serpent. It's the devil. We'll look at that for just a minute. And so do you think that... Uh, Satan's really this big, enormous red dragon, you know, with the horns and a tail. Or is that symbolic? I think it's more symbolic of his evil, wickedness, his fierce deadliness. Maybe red equals bloodshed. He's a murderer. Some theologians believe that the seven heads of the dragon represent intelligence, that he's cunning, lying, wicked, evil, vicious, deceitful, smart. And the horns represent his power to deceive and to lie. And so I think that's a better picture of what we see of Satan. 
All right, let's move on here. Let's look at uh, verse 5. It says, She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. And so it, this woman of Israel, Satan's right there ready to devour this child born. And all the theologians agree that this male child is Jesus. Jesus is a lot of prophecy. He rules with an iron scepter. And so he's coming after Jesus. But God protects him. And then there's war breaking out in uh, heaven. This is 12-7. And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But Satan, he was not strong enough, and they lost his place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to earth, and his angels with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven, and they're proclaiming, he's gone. He's been thrown to earth. And uh, the one who's been accusing us has been thrown down. And so we see here this battle in heaven. And Michael, the archangel, he's believed to be the top angel. And so he shows up and does battle with Satan, and he's thrown down. And so you just have this big picture of this battle happening in heaven. And uh, let's look at uh, one thing. It talks about overcoming, how to overcome Satan in chapter. And so I want to look at that. It says, they overcame him, this is verse 11, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life so much as to shrink from death. And so we had Tracy give his testimony last Sunday here of just freedom that he found. And it's a powerful testimony. You think about the blood of the lamb and how it was over the doorposts. Remember in Egypt, and the death angel just left him alone. We have that blood of Jesus covering and protecting us. And then gets right down to it. We don't love our so much to shrink from death. We don't love our lives so much so that we, re we refuse to deny Jesus, don't we? And if we refuse to deny Jesus and still die, we're overcomers, it says. It says they overcome him. We will overcome Satan at that point and enter into heaven. It's called being a martyr. You know, the disciples, most of them were martyred. They were killed just for loving Jesus. You think about Nero, the Roman Empire, just wicked man, would burn Christians alive. He would throw them in the Colosseum, have them be eaten by wild beasts. You know what? They did not deny Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And Jesus now is called them overcomers, and they're with him in heaven. Amen. So we've seen from the disciples of old to today, people being killed just for following Jesus Christ. There's a whole magazine called The Voice of the Martyrs. Why? Because people still around the whole world are being killed. Just going to church in Africa I read a story not long ago. People were just machine gunned down. All they were doing is walking to church. Uh, we saw ISIS with the swords killing Christians. And so it's still happening. But all of those who refuse to deny Jesus as their Lord and Lord and King of King are overcomers. And remember what Jesus told us if you're overcomer, the rewards? I don't think it's important to remember the rewards. He said in Revelation, he talked about this when he was talking about the churches. He said the rewards you eat from the tree of life. You receive a crown of life. You're not hurt by the second death. You'll receive the hidden manna. You'll receive a white stone and a new name. Power over nations. You'll receive the morning star. You'll wear right, white raiment clothing. And your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. And it'll never be blotted out. God will make you a pillar in his temple. You'll receive the name of God and you will sit with Christ in his throne and eat with him. I love that reward. I want to eat with Jesus, <laughs> right? I love the throne and if we could have dinner too, man, what a party, right? What an awesome party. It just all the rewards just blow me away. Okay, now we get into 13. 13 is where we got these beasts popping up and uh, we're going to look at some of that and the dragon. Uh, first, I've got... Uh, let's just look at some of the views of the beast. Uh, number one view, there's just this literal view that there are these terrifying monster lookies out kill and destroy. Number two is a symbolic view that one beast is the Antichrist and one beast is the false prophet. 
Catholic view is that the beast represents like a post-Antichrist government and a future Antichrist government, okay? So just Antichrist means against Christ. Governments are against Christ. They're evil governments that have been in the past. But there's this future government that's representing that this beast now coming after is represented as well. And then the fourth one is maybe a united type government power that is the Antichrist that is still to come. And now some people believe like the Antichrist is a man who must his peace, he gathers the world together, right? And then he comes and deals with all this and pops. So that kind of view of this Antichrist. Um, I put out some of these on the back tables because sometimes visual aids help. Daniel had a dream about a man with the four different metals and on his feet was iron and clay. And this iron and clay is still yet to be foreseen what that beast would be. Who's that beast? Okay. And then, uh, so you just have these different parts of Daniel's dream uh, matching the beast and the different descriptions of the beast in Revelation. So it's, it's kind of fascinating. Uh, just saying that this is their view of it. Um, I have one on the false prophet, uh, the woman of the satanic trinity. Satanic trinity, they're calling, you know, you have the dragon and the two beasts make a trinity, satanic trinity. So I just, just something to look at, something to think about. Uh, I'm not saying that they're accurate. It's just saying that it's, some, it's interesting to see the different views. All right, so let's get into chapter 13. First verse. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea and he had 10 horns and seven heads and, and the 10 crowns on his horns. And each... His head is a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. And the dragon gave the beast his power, his throne, and his authority. So whatever beast this is, whatever's coming, this evil, Satan said, hey, take my authority, take my throne, take my power. Okay? Then we get to verse 5. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words, blasphemies, exercise authority for 42 months. He opened up his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander the name and the dwelling place of those who live in heaven. And he was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. So what it's saying is, if our name is written in the lamb book of life, we will not worship the beast. That's what it's saying here. Those people would not worship the beast. Now, will we be killed? It's not real clear. It's obviously coming after the saints, he says, to conquer them. But what happens if we're killed? Then we become martyrs. We become overcomers. We get to be with the Lord, okay? Um, Let's shoot down to uh, 15. Now we've got another beast showing up. This beast is uh, coming. It says he's uh, 15. He was given power to give the breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. So this beast is giving all his power to the first beast. Satan gave all his power to the first beast. You see that? So this first beast got all the power. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark on the right hand or on the forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast and the number of his name. And so here we see, he's saying, forcing everyone, causing all who refuse to worship the beast to be killed. So once again, where are we at with this? we may be killed. This may be a view, though, as just these people of the world. They're not necessarily uh, Christians, but the world system, people get involved in that, and these people are killed if they don't uh, worship the beast. It's not really clear, but once again, if we are killed, we know where we're at. Um, and we certainly don't want this mark of the beast. Um, then we get into the number of the beast. That's verse 18. You put verse 18 on the board. It's 666. It says it stands for the number of man. And, uh, interesting. One who is that, you know, man was uh, created in the image of God on the sixth day, right? You're to plow the land for six years and then rest. And so they get to see some of these scriptures. Um, 
I looked at this book. This is a book we gave our uh, small group leaders. Uh, it says, you can understand the book of Revelation. <laughs> all right? Well, even this guy doesn't have all the understanding. He doesn't really know what 666 really means. Uh, there's different views on it. And this guy, he, he says we stand Revelation, but to his view, right? Because this book has a different view of Revelation. And so which one's right, right? So that's why a lot of churches avoid Revelation. Because <laughs> if you get into this stuff and you get really, you could just, you know, tear your hair out trying to figure it out. And uh, so that's why I just want to point out, there's different views, okay? Just keep that in mind. This guy did say one thing. He says, no matter what the theories are, whatever it means, we know it stands for the Antichrist and resembles his control on earth and we're to have nothing to do with it, okay? That's, that's a good synopsis right there. Okay, how are we doing? We're doing good. We're moving through this. Now uh, we get into uh, chapter 14. Oh, wait, I just, want to, I just want to point out one thing. This is really bad if you take the uh, mark of the beast. Um, yeah, let's just read that first. I guess I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. 14, let's just start 14. 14.1. 14, this is uh, the 100 and 144,000. It said, then I looked and before me was a lamb standing on Mount Zion with him the 144,000 who had his name of their father's name written on their foreheads. So here we see it written on their foreheads, huh? And uh, they're shown like a, like a city on a hill, aren't they? It says they're on a, on a mountain, Mount Zion, for everyone to see this glorious 144,000. I think it's a picture Jesus showing this is what a saint looks like. This is what my saints look like. They're pure, there's no lie, there's no defilement, there's first fruits, they're purchased, they're redeemed, they're faultless, right? And so we see that in this picture, uh, verse 14, 4. It says, these are all those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They fall lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and the lamb. No lie was found in their mouths, and they are blameless. And so we just see this purity about them. You could take time and there's these books talk about pages of what it means to be purchased, what it means to be a first fruit, what it means to have no lie in your mouth, right? And this purity, the, uh, they didn't have any defilement with women, could be an example of just spiritual purity is one of the views that, you know, it's just, it, scripture talks about be pure as a virgin, be pure as uh, pure milk, you know, newborn milk. Be that pure. And so that could be a spiritual purity, not necessarily a literal purity that they didn't have sex with women. You know, hopefully like their wife, um, you know what I'm talking about? Just, they were, <laughs> there's just a purity about them. <laughs> I don't know. So anyways, they are just pure. They are faultless. There's nothing, they have just like are tracking 100% with the Lord and just a beautiful purity. Okay. <laughs> now we get to uh, these three angels uh, showing up. And uh, getting ahead of my notes here. So in 14.6, we have the three angels show up. Then I saw another angel flying in midair. And he had the gospel proclaim to live on earth, every nation, tribe, language, and people. And he said, fear of God and give him glory. So we have an angel proclaiming the eternal gospel to who? To nations. Where else do we see it's important that everyone hear the gospel? Well, if we go to uh, Matthew 24, Jesus himself talks about some end times. And one of the things he says in verse 13, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved and the gospel of his kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. One of the theories is that if somehow we miss some small people group before Jesus comes, this angel's gonna let them know about it. <laughs> and so, because the angel's letting everyone know the gospel for once and for all, everyone will hear it if it hasn't already happened by that time. And uh, I, I think it's important to, to remember what Jesus says about being saved. He says those 
who endure to the end will be saved. We have to keep marching, don't we? We have to keep holding on to him. We can't turn our backs. We can't run and hide. We have to just hold on in the true faith of our Lord and Savior. And he will, he will protect us and he will deliver us. And if we die, we'll be with him, okay? So just an encouragement there that we just have to hold tight to him till the very end. All right. Then we get... Uh, let me, just, let me just share a minute here. I think uh, for me, what this book of Revelation's done for me is just stirred it hard and uh, like a renewed fire in me. I don't know, I think it's, uh, somebody was telling me how they're so excited about the thousand year millennial reign when, when things are gonna be so beautiful and awesome. For me, it's the throne room and the power and the lightning and the smoke and, and there's a rainbow and there's just all this magnificent worship. And for me, that stirs my heart, that I want to be there. I want to follow Jesus. I, I'm excited for that, to be a part of that. And it makes me want to read the Bible more. It makes me want to witness more. It makes me want to be the man of God that I've been called to be, that God has for me. And so I hope Revelation stirs your heart in that regard. Amen. All right, I just plowed through that in record time. Why don't we have the worship team come up? <laughs> and uh, we're not done yet, but <clears throat> uh, chapter 14, starting at verse 14, then it just turns really bloody. Jesus shows up with a sickle, with these angels, and there's a lot of death. Okay, I'll tell you that. There's a lot of bloodshed. And, uh, and, yeah, there's really nothing good to say about it, but it's just he's making justice and he's judging evil and that's what's happening there. He has a sharp sickle. It's the wine press wrath of God Almighty happening. But you remember when Jesus came to earth? Remember how he came? He's born in a barn or a cave. He came as a servant. He came in obedience. He came in humility, he came with mercy and grace and compassion. He came to save the lost. But when Jesus comes to earth again, he comes what? A supreme commander. When he comes, yeah, he's gonna rule heaven and earth. He's gonna be the king of heaven and earth with the angels and rule. He'll come in glorious majesty. He'll come with an iron scepter and sit on the throne. All of Jesus' glory is gonna fill the earth. All of Jesus' glory is gonna fill heaven. And there's what's gonna happen. There's not gonna be any more tear or crying or pain. There's gonna be a new heaven and a new earth because he creates all things new. He said, look, I'm making all things new. Come. Any of you who are thirsty, come and drink the water of life of Jesus. So if you're out there today or you're on uh, you, uh, the video right now on Facebook, know that Jesus is calling you to come to him, to be near him, to experience the glorious majesty of his returning. He is going to come and it's going to be glorious and you don't want to miss it. Amen. It says that the government's going to rest on his shoulders and Isaiah talks about it. That's the government I want to vote for. You know, amen. No more tears, no more crying, no more pain. 